Hello and welcome to the April 10th meeting, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Uh, the time is 7.02. We have all members present except Laura um, and staff, Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek. Um, so we have a new member tonight, Rachel Loeffler. Did I say that correctly, Rachel? Loeffler, but Loeffler works too. Oh, yeah. Loeffler, okay. <laughs> welcome. Um, do you want to take a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself to the commission and like maybe tell us something about your background. Sure. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, I've been in, living in Amherst since 2016 um, and I've been practicing with Berkshire Design Group as a landscape architect um, since 2014. Um, so our firm is multidisciplinary and um, very interested in sort of how um, land development and intersects with the protection of wetlands and conservation areas, especially as as the climate is changing and, and precip precipitation is changing and, and, and things are changing all around us. So it's wild to see it happen with our own eyes and want to be part of that conversation. We're happy to have you with us. Um, should we do a little round robin um, and just give like one minute intro bio? I'm gonna start with Andre, put you on the spot. Hi, Rachel, welcome. I'm um, Andre Gadera. Um, let's see, uh, first time I uh, got to Amherst, we moved, uh, I moved with my parents uh, back in 83 for my senior year in, in high school. I stayed here for uh, college, went to UMass and got a uh, degree in wildlife biology. And I, spent uh 20 well i spent about uh 26 years with u.s fish and wildlife service as a uh, uh, uh law enforcement agent and um retired and was uh recently a park ranger with the state um so yeah i've got a lot of interest in um in uh wetlands and in uh, wildlife, of course, the wildlife aspect of it, and uh, uh, in protecting what uh, Amherst uh, has uh, has left. It's my minute. Thanks, Andre. Alex? Uh, Rachel and I met on a site visit at Amherst College, and I introduced myself then, so I will give my time to somebody else. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Bruce? I'm Rachel's recruiter. <laughs> I was looking forward to your bios. Um, okay. Um, I am from Amherst. Um, I've since spent time elsewhere. Um, my background is in wildlife ecology and natural resource management. And I currently work in for land trust and endangered species management and all things related to the conservation and perpetual management of um, critical habitats. So that's that. Sorry, Dave and Aaron. Do you want, do you want to give your bios? Or you already met Rachel. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, my name's Aaron Jock. Uh, Rachel and I have worked a little bit together. Um, I um, have been with the town for about five years, and I'd say my background is um, municipal conservation and also GIS analysis, all things from um, uh, conservation related to land use to public health. Um, so that's all. Good evening, Rachel. Uh, we've met before during the interview process, Dave Zomek, I'm the assistant town manager and, and my role, I'm fairly new to Amherst, so I'm just getting to know the community, but um, uh, joking, <laughs> I've been here a while. Um, I've worked for the town for about 20 years and my job um, is is a really, interesting mix of, of land use and development and conservation and historic preservation, affordable housing. And um, it's, it's a fun job to have as, as the director of conservation and development. And I dabble in, in recreation projects and town common projects as well. So happy to have you on board. And uh, uh, I will, I am here for many of the meetings tonight. I may not be here for the whole meeting. I'm actually wearing kind of multiple hats um, uh, while our town manager is away. So um, I may be here for part of the meeting and then uh, either jump on another meeting or or get a few things done uh, while he's away. So welcome. 
All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. Mill history, Mill River history trail update. Dave and I had a meeting with um, the committee or the representatives, the team um, that's uh, putting that forward. And we talked about signage, content of signage. Um, some things will probably be bullet pointing and circulating to commissioners to get some input on things we'd like to see incorporated in that material. So just for the background, this is the Mill River History Trail, which will go from about uh, the North Amherst Library up to uh, Cushman Center. And yeah, we just want to give them a little input on some historical ecology, fish passage, um, just some things we'd like to see on that on that trail and coordinating with um, signage design. So keep an eye out for that. Um, director's report, hand it over to Dave. Sure, I'll be very brief, a couple of quick updates. Um, I did make a presentation to the town council on Monday evening on Hickory Ridge, the property and the project. Um, I think Aaron, Aaron uh, was instrumental in helping me to pull that together. Um, we'd be happy to send that around or a link to that. Maybe Aaron could do that in the coming days. It's also on the town council um, um, page uh, in their packet, but it was well received by the council. They're very interested and, and impressed with the work that town staff and consultants have done there. Uh, everything from ecological assessment to the, the grants that we've received and um, even looking at the potential for some of the frontage to be used for, for other municipal purposes, uh, such as a fire station. So. Uh, we'll send that um, quick PowerPoint around. I think it's about 16 or 18 slides. Um, staying with Hickory Ridge, I think Aaron may have other updates, but um, uh, our, cons our, our contractor, uh, Taylor Davis, landscaping Taylor Davis uh, construction uh, has been out there um, this week with some good weather, beginning to put up erosion control and turtle uh, fencing for, um, for the loop trail and the north-south uh, connecting trail. So we're finally getting going on that. Uh, we have some turtle trainings going uh, going on soon um, for staff and, and contractors. So it's uh, exciting to get going on that. I know that Pure Sky is um, uh, back back on the site and, and beginning to make some progress around uh, rainstorms. And then staff and I working with the, uh, Aaron and I working with the fire department, we've also been, um, making some progress on the emergency access, and we'll have updates uh, for you on that in the coming meetings. Um, for River Farm, uh, just I believe Aaron will be talking about this later, but we are trying to um, come up with some, some solutions for some drainage there in the parking lot of Fort River Farm. Alex and I and others talked about it when we were on some site visits some weeks ago, and um, we're working on a plan to address some of that drainage there and and likely of course we'll be back to talk to you about that and then finally um i can't remember Aaron, whether we reported on the dam and seawall grant i i think we've been talking about it but it was submitted last friday i believe it was uh this is a grant for design we submitted it to the um dam and seawall program which is under um, dcr dam safety a state agency, and uh, we we put in a grant for design, about two hundred fifty thousand for the grant ask, uh, and we are required to put in another one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty, and match. So the total project could be around four hundred, four ten, and this is for design uh, of improvements, repairs to the dike structure, the dam structure. Uh, we'll be looking at bathymetry. We'll be looking at depth of sediment, depth of the pond, of course, bathymetry, and also um, um, uh, sediment. Uh, we'll be doing sediment cores, some survey work, and really kind of get poised to to begin to address uh -huh. issues up at Puffer's Pond. Um, I want to make clear that you know the dam and dike are safe. They're not in any uh, threat of of uh, collapse or anything like that. This is just kind of long overdue work uh, with a particular focus on the dike, which does need some work. Um, um, so anyway, uh, did we leave anything out on the da uh, dam and seawall uh, grant, Aaron? There's there's about six or seven elements to it for the total uh, cost of about 400,000. And of course that does not include construction and will cross 
across that uh, that bridge, if you will, when we come to it. Yeah, so it's just for design and permitting. Once we, we get more. the design and permitting completed, we'll have to come back for all the construction costs. Yeah, there's extensive permitting with that project. So so I think I'll stop there, given your full agenda. If anybody has any quick questions, happy to do a speed round of questions if there are any. Thanks, Dave. Looks like Alex has a question. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I have two real quick. Uh, I had to chuckle when you were talking about training turtles. When you get them all trained, would you give us a show? <laughs> <laughs> Little training, yeah. Little and then, training, yeah. The other, training, training the, the, the yes. Anyway, um, and as far as the dam goes, last time he talked about that, he gave us a very nice presentation, and I brought up the subject of fishways. And I don't know if that's in your proposal, but if you want a quarter page write up suggesting it and providing some justification, I'm happy to do that. We would welcome that if you wanted to put something together, Alex. Um, it is not part of the formal repairs per se that we are looking for, but while we're while we're um, uh, peeling things back and looking deeper at puffers, dredging, um, you know, uh, uh, emergency access, emergency uh, uh, systems there, as well as um, the dike and the dam. Absolutely, if if you want to put something together. I think staff would welcome reading that and taking a look. Um, absolutely. I'll talk to Aaron about timing. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, on to minutes. Bruce, thanks for taking the minutes as always. Um, I saw Alex had some comments come in. So I think just um, given those, we're good to make a motion. Um, I also realized Jason's not here tonight and I hadn't. Uh, commented on that. Do we expect Jason coming or we heard from him? No, Jason won't be here tonight. He's away. Okay. So yeah, he'll be out All right. tonight. So for tonight's minutes, Bruce. Um, okay. So we're looking for a motion to approve the minutes for 327-2024. Yeah. Before we do that, um, I did send, you mentioned that I sent some comments to you and Aaron and Bruce um, if they're fine uh, and you don't think we need to put them up on the screen, that's, that's fine. But yeah. I was fine with them. If you want to just move to approve with those edits. Yeah, that's fine. So I, I'll move that we approve the minutes with those changes that I suggested. For a second. Second. Alex on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Do I? It's... You can no, abstain, she can't. Rachel. Sorry, yeah. That's fine. I can't, I can't vote right because I'm... Correct. Yes. Thank you. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. I'm an aye. <clears throat> okay, land management updates. The OSRPU plan um still open spread the word anything else <laughs> i think what the the um group is is going to be meeting tomorrow to deter dis discuss next steps so i'll have more of an update um once we've sort of regrouped post um post survey okay and can you remind us when that survey closes dave do you know i'm not certain if it's closed already or if it's still open I believe it may have closed okay. last week. Okay. Um, not one hundred percent sure on that, but I think, I think it did close. Okay. If I might make a comment, I found the survey really long and difficult to uh, to fill out. I don't know. I my heart's in it, and that's why I did it. But I think I would have had a really hard time uh, if it weren't. Just a comment. You aren't the only one, Andre. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, just that other people have commented in various ways about those kinds of things, and those comments got passed on to the team. So at some um, when, when it happens again, they can take that information and work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it looks like the survey is open still. Um, Does it yep. list 
Does it list a closing? I think it used to list the closing. I yeah, thought. I thought it was updated to April 22nd, uh, but it now Maybe doesn't it say that. So Maybe there's a little more time. Okay, well, for all the um, public here tonight, if you are up for it, please visit the Town of Amherst website and participate in the 2024 Open Space and Recreation Survey. So the first part's open space and the second part's recreation. Um, okay, great. Now on to land use application, Amherst College. Um, so this is a recurring one. Is it uh, maybe possibly annually? And there it's a water quality sampling and they're very great at reporting back their survey results to us, which then get posted on the Amherst website. Um, so I have no questions or issues with this one. Any comments or questions from commissioners or Aaron, do you wanna? Yeah, okay. I think they they test at various locations um, throughout town, and they've even incorporated some additional testing sites sort of at our recommendations. So I think it's a great program and they incorporate, um, you know, student learning in the in the process. So I think it's another one of those great partnerships with the with the colleges where we get to sort of reap some benefits from um, having some uh, academic uh, inquiry into the quality of our streams. Thanks. Um, and if anyone is in the audience representing that and you want to say anything, please just raise your hand. Go ahead, Alex. Dave has talked a number of times about water quality in Parvis Pond, and, but, and he's talked about trying to develop something with UMass to track that down. Um, I wonder if we could talk to Amherst College about joining in that effort if they, um, as part of their water quality analysis. And I don't know if Dave has already thought about that, but here they are and they have a program and we have a problem. If I could, Michelle, yeah, I'd be, be happy to, um, happy to talk with uh, Amherst College about that. I do know that, um, you know, one of the big challenges is just oftentimes the sampling is done by students or volunteers or 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 others, sometimes faculty. Um, and the challenge often is getting sampling when the the rain events happen, you know, right after. And those could happen at three in the morning or Sunday afternoon or or whatever during holidays. So I I know they're a little bit maxed out on some of the research they've done, but I'm happy to ask Alex. It's um, we're trying to get a little traction from the university on helping us with buffers. And it's just been a question of, of kind of focus for Aaron and myself. So we've had some initial conversations, but we need to move, move that forward. So I'm happy to ask Amherst College. Yeah, and if I recall, they don't quite do like E. coli monitoring necessarily, or it's more of a sediment load and macro invertebrate type of thing. So but still, still worth an ask to see if they might want to expand their sampling um, breath. Okay. Go Keep ahead. in mind that E. coli is, on, is in every stream. Right. Levels therein. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we're just looking for a motion to approve the land use application for Amherst Quality Water, Amherst College Water Quality Analysis. And it's uh, CLU-24-4. So moved. Say the number again, sorry. CLU-24-4. Thank you. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Wow, we have eight minutes. Okay. Um, can we quickly move on to some yeah other business? Yes. Um, enforcement compliance. Um, sure. Do you want to do enforcement, or do you want to try to get the um, the continuation or the um, yeah the extension for the order of conditions first, Michelle? There's two other business items. Or river, um, or river farm yeah sure we can start with that okay um so i received um a request to um continue the 
to extend the order of conditions for the uh, Fort River Farm order of conditions. Part of the reason was anybody who's visited Fort River Farm um, community gardens recently or parking lot, um, there's a drainage issue going on there. And originally when the project was permitted, there was supposed to be a swale installed. Um, but the the parking lot is actually like the staging area for the um, floodplain restoration area that was constructed at the end of the fairing. So um, I think the construction of the swale didn't happen. And so um, we received a request to continue or to extend the order of conditions um, in order to allow that construction work on the swale to, to take place so that we can hopefully deal with that drainage situation. Um, and I'll pull up the screen so that we have a motion to read from. I move to issue a three-year extension uh, to the order of conditions DEP number 089-0684. Second. Alex on the motion, Bruce on the second. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Muted, Andre. Yeah, I was saying it anyway. I. <laughs> I know, and I. I have a question. Yep. Um. You didn't. I didn't see the application in the uh, in the folder. I just saw the memo, but I'm curious if the drainage pipe coming out of the nearby residence will get fixed, or whether we're just going to deal with it um, and the products that come from it. I um, I don't know if Dave wants to speak to this, but I think it becomes complicated dealing with offsite situations. So I think we'll just have to discuss that and sort of formulate how the town wants to proceed with it. But I think construction of the swale is a good first step to try to address some of the stormwater issues. Yeah, so in Massachusetts, is it legal to uh, divert water onto another person's property? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, in New Hampshire, it's not. In other <laughs> states, it's not. And that water is being diverted onto Port River Farm property. Yeah, we're we're going to look at all of that, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, uh, Alex. Um, I think it's a good question. That pipe and that drainage has been there for a couple of decades, so we're going to look at that. But um, in the meantime, you know at least the short term, putting in the drainage that was planned all along for that parking lot is kind of step one. But we are going to have conversations with that owner. We know that owner well. Uh, he's, he and his company have been very supportive of the um, the gardens and, and our access there through his property. So we're going to look at the whole picture and see if we can solve the problem and, and apply some creativity there. So we'll we'll keep the commission informed. It's going to take a little while. It's not an easy fix overnight, but getting that drainage swale in there ASAP would be a, a good first step. And we'll see what that does for the parking lot as well as the gardens, because as you know, the water is moving. Uh, I guess that would be east uh, toward the gardens. So we'll keep you posted. I'm well aware of it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So that's our motion, or did we already do that one? <laughs> Oh, we did a motion. Okay, and sorry. It already passed. Yep. <laughs> um, on to the enforcement updates. So start with Trillium. Yeah. So um, in your packets, you'll see that there was a request from um, uh, the owner's son basically to ask for an extension for the um, stabilization of the site. Um, there have been measures installed, I am told. I wasn't able to get out there um, because I had a, an illness in my house this week, um, but the uh, I did speak with um, uh, Mr. McChee's son, and they uh, have sod being delivered, um, I believe, next week, and they're planning to install everything so that the site is, is stabilized within the next couple weeks, but they're requesting additional time because it's with the weather it's been difficult to get everything lined up um i was sent photos um by 
Iman this evening, but I haven't had a chance to review them and I haven't had a chance to download them to put them in your folder. So I realize it's um, it's a little difficult, but I, I can say that the front of the site is stabilized. Um, there were some additional measures. The last time I was out there, I believe I believe Alex and I were out there the last time um, that I visited the site and there were some ongoing issues that needed resolution. Um, I just haven't had an opportunity to go out and verify that those items have been completed, but I'm told that the stabilization is completed on the rear slope um, and that erosion controls have been have been corrected. So um, kind of taking a good faith um, uh, belief that they're they're taking they're they are moving um, in a positive direction I believe um, trying to comply with the enforcement order and um, I would support al allowing them to take additional time to to stabilize the site since they've been working with us um, cooperatively thanks Aaron do you do we have a suggested deadline for the extension um yeah so it's, I'm just going to toggle to my um, back over to the folder so I can um, try to open up Iman's email. Um, and I'll... While you're looking, can I uh, just make a comment? Of course. So when I read the memo, it was all about sod and um, loam, but I didn't see him say anything about removing uh, the material from the slope that is it within the uh, so he didn't say anything maybe you have information that they in fact have pulled back a lot of that material that they moved down the slope mm -hmm. and it so I'm I'm interested to know um, if he's I mean that was part of the season and desist order was to get that stuff out of there mm -hmm. And I didn't see any mention that they had done any work on it. I thought they had, but Aaron, update. Yeah. So um, from the, so historically speaking, they did do a great deal of removal. Alex, when we were out there, there was some remaining fill. Um, and I think that they sort of had assumed that they had removed all they needed to. And when Alex and I went out there, we made it clear, nope, there's still a great deal, deal of fill out here that still needs to be taken. Um, uh, Mr. McChee, you know, said he was going to address it. So I have to sort of um, assume that that's going to happen. But if it's, if it hasn't been done, they're, they're still going to have to take care of it. The other thing I can, um, get out there for a site visit and share photos with you um, in the in the interim before um, the next meeting so that we can feel confident before they install the sod on the site that um, all of that material is out. And certainly we could issue um, an extension of the deadline with the assumption that they've taken care of all of the items that were asked of them, including the removal of the, the fill that was placed without a permit. And so um, the reason I the reason I ask is because once they put sod down, they're not going to be wanting to put heavy equipment across that sod. Yeah. If they needed to to get material out, mm -hmm. so I would I would ask them not to put the sod down until you're satisfied that they have complied with what you asked them to do with regard to the material on the slope. I think that's the, totally the sod, reasonable. The sod will be a barrier to them doing any additional work on the, on the slope. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's a completely reasonable condition. Um, so they did ask until um, April 26th to extend the deadline to April 26th. And so the commission is aware when Aaron and I were out there, they were pouring cement for a, a rather large patio. And while they were there, they, uh, poured cement in light fixtures, which are inside the 100 foot buffer, which were not authorized. And the cement was still wet. I could put my finger in it, it hadn't even set up. And then they dumped the cement truck, dumped, washed as they usually do and left all the cement right there uh, <clears throat> uh, inside the 100 foot buffer. Somebody would have to clean that up. 
but I, they they were doing work inside the buffer when the season assist order was in place. What date was that, Alex? Or that was last week. Was that last week? I think we were there on a Friday. Yeah, I think it was a week from Friday. Um, so, so I do agree with Alex um, that the the cement should not have been being washed where it was. I, I did put, did I put um, the photos in the folder so you guys could see the latest? Okay. It was there's really, one. there's only one photo. Um, with the cement in it. But... Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was, it was really mu muddy. There was cement washing down the slope into the buffer. One of the things that Alex and I asked for were for survey stakes to be placed a hundred feet from the wetland boundary so that we could actually determine where the 100 foot buffer was and I do agree with Alex that those um I, you know it's tough to tell where the 100 foot buffer is because they used a measuring tape so you know the measurements don't follow the slope they f go as the crow flies um from a survey measurement so um that's why we did ask for the 100 foot buffer to be staked out um so I think we need to confirm that the erosion controls were corrected, that the fill is removed, that the 100 foot buffer has been staked, um, and the stabilization measures on the rear slope have been installed. Um, assuming that those things have happened, I think um, it would be reasonable to allow more time. I also did tell Mr. McChee that the commission may be requiring an after the fact notice of intent application for this in order to require additional mitigation on the slope and within the 100 foot buffer particularly if the buffer zone impacts to the buffer zone are determined once survey stakes are placed. So, um, okay. Um, it's messy. Yeah. That's different than what I saw when I was out there. Um, Bruce, go ahead. Just a reminder that when I was out there, some of the downslope erosion was actually going under the filter fabric and onto the neighbor property off the site completely and that that piece of it has to also be addressed so michelle i'm going to suggest that um we might hold this conversation and continue it um until after the hearings just because i see it's 7 35 and i want sure to be... okay this is a more in-depth conversation yeah. um all right so we'll revisit the um enforcement order on this one and the other one um okay I'm going to skip back to our first hearing. So this is a notice of intent for SWCA on behalf, sorry, I'm going to leave my hearing page. All right, hearing is general procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. The hearing structure is five minutes from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes of public comment, or two minutes per person, five minutes for conservation commissioners. The commission now requires all submitted and revised materials to be submitted by the Wednesday prior to the meeting at close of business. Um, for all members of the public, please clearly state your name, address, who you're representing, and any preferred pronouns. Um, same for presenters. Okay, first up, notice of intent for SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structure in the 100-foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at Lot 13 Olympia Drive, Map 8D, Lot 15, 16, and 3. Do we have anybody here tonight for this? I'm not sure if the applicant's representative is here or not, but I can give the commission a quick update. Um, but if yeah. anybody is here, please raise your hand. Um, so I have met with UMass several times to sort of discuss path forward, and I'll just try to briefly summarize. Um, UMass was on hold because they were conducting a in-depth study of parking um, on campus to determine whether they actually needed Lot 13 because they were considering whether they even needed it. They were considering just dropping it all together. But because there's several large construction projects impacting um, parking areas on campus, they feel like they really do need Lot 13. Um, so they did re-engage with, I believe it's Woodward, 
Woodward and Curran, I can't recall the name of the company that they retained, um, but they're, they've re-engaged with the um, engineer and they um, are working on revisions. However, they recognize the sort of conundrum that the commission is in and they have asked that the commission take no action tonight. So they're not asking for a continuation. They don't want the commission to deny the project. What they're asking is basically to give them some time to take the commission's, um, to make the recommended revisions and take the commission's comments into consideration. And once those um, revisions have been made, they would re-notify abutters, repost the legal ad and essentially start over at square one again. Um, which they hope to do in the next month or two. Um, so it's it's different than what we discussed last time. Um, however, I think they're feeling like they they want to proceed and they're they want to, in fairness to the public, um, recognize that they're willing to re-notify abutters and re-notify the public. Thanks, Sarah. And if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on the room. Um, I don't know who is first, Andre. So, um, what what are the uh, what are the alternatives here? I mean, um, what they're I mean, I mean, I think the ones who are in a conundrum are them. Just to say that um, we've uh, we've been you know we've basically kicked this can down the road for uh, what six months at least. Um, I'm not willing to. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to keep on doing that. But what, so I, what I'm wondering is what is the reason why they wouldn't um, refile later? Because I mean, they're going through the same steps, uh, at they, least butter notification and so on. Uh, it's the application that they're not willing to, to start with. I don't, I don't think I, I think they need a fresh start, but that's, so can 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 I hear what uh, what it is that they're what the reasoning for not uh, restarting it? You mean not withdrawing the application? Not withdrawing or mm -hmm. or you know taking Us. taking a a closure of of this application and then uh, it's yeah I mean they would keep their same DEP number so it it you know there's some challenges there for them. Um, Aaron, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, just from an administrative standpoint, refiling is a little more complicated. Um, you know, they'd they'd have to go through that reapplication process. Um, and again, it's it's at the commission's discretion here. This is this is just what they're asking. But um, uh, I think it's simpler for them to re-notify abutters and repost a legal ad and come back to us with a revision and try to sort of reopen things um, under their existing application. Um, so I think that's what they're hoping to do. Um, I think I just remember uh, a a clear um, statement made by uh, SWCA representatives uh, regarding the timing and timeliness of uh, of the town um, and uh, and the commission in uh, addressing the issue at the beginning. I'm not. You know, I'm not. I just don't want to. I I don't want to be getting into any kind of complications uh, with that in the future. Thanks, Andre. Bruce. My preference is to have whichever alternative we take that it enhance the opportunity that the vernal pool will be fully protected and engaged in the planning, and that they address all of that stockpiling of of materials that's right up against the edge of the project and the, on the, I guess it's the northeast side of the thing. <clears throat> and Alex knows what I'm talking about because he was on the site visit. And if, it, if an alter, whichever alternative addresses those two things in a significant way, that's my preference. Thanks, Bruce. Dave? Yes, uh, thanks, Michelle. I was just gonna add, you know, Aaron referenced a recent meeting that she and I had with some of the senior leadership at UMass. And I think they were very apologetic. They were, they were, you know, in general, this is not the way they wanted to do to do permitting and, and do the the work with the town. 
Um, I think up until now, we had mostly heard from their consultant and maybe some, some lower level project managers. And we were talking to some of the senior leadership at, um, at the physical plant and above. So, you know, I'm hoping, I'm, I guess I'm advocating to give UMass the benefit of the doubt. I do think they're going to come back with a, a smaller footprint. I don't know all, we didn't hear all the details about vernal pools and some of the other issues that, that uh, Bruce mentioned, but um, I felt, you know, assured by them that they are taking a new tact. There was some, um, I, there was also some absence of some of the, the the project managers at higher levels during that period when they uh, had 11 continuances and such. So I was just advocating to give them the benefit of the doubt and let's see what they come back with um, uh, very soon. I think we were promised some some new plans very, very quickly from that meeting, which I believe was last week. So that is my comment on on this project. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. I'm not sure, Bruce, to your point that we necessarily lose control over, um, you know, the protection of the resources. We just stay in, <laughs> stay in the track. But if, you know, Aaron, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, no, I'm 100% any application that comes to us is going to get reviewed for compliance with the regulations. And we're going to make sure that they're held to um meeting the standards of our regs and and hopefully providing some mitigation um, to compensate for the impact of the footprint of the, the parking area that they're proposing. But um, what I was going to suggest is maybe we say to UMass, if you don't submit materials within the next 30 to 60 days, we would like for you to withdraw and refile. Just trying to throw out an idea um, that gives them kind of a benchmark um, that if they don't, if they don't, um, Renotify a butters with it and and repost a legal ad within a certain period of time. If they don't provide revisions to us within a certain period of time, that after a certain period, the commission's not gonna, you know, we're just gonna ask them to withdraw the application. Sure, Alex. There's a parking lot adjacent to the one that they proposed, which is never full. They, um, it's a very large parking lot. It has very few cars in it. I'm not going to judge whether or not they need new parking, but there's a parking lot right there, which hardly, it has three snow removal vehicles truck in it right now. I just drove by there the other day. And my feeling is that this is the project that caused us to uh, give considerable con time and discussion to continuances. And we've asked for a number of things here, which I was anticipating they would come back they obviously uh, haven't, and I, they know what we want. So my inclination is to say no and let them decide whether it's worth their money and time to refile if they really need the parking lot that badly, but to not, not spend any more time on it. It's already cost us a lot of time. And I Thanks. that that's that's probably my two minutes, but I, it's not to say I don't care about the vernal pool. I'd love to see that buffer restored, but they know what we want. And if they want to come back, I'm sure that would be in the package. So okay. I, um, yeah. Well, how about, uh, okay, Andrea, I see your hands up again. I'm going to, I'm thinking we might want to do a show of hands here who's weighing in on extending this or not, but go ahead, Andre. Yeah. Uh... Right on the uh, right on topic. Um, after hearing David, Dave, and uh, Aaron's comments, I, I I'm flexible on it. Okay, um, I'm flexible. I think for that thirty to sixty day suggestion, I'm I'm weighing on thirty, not sixty. I think we've already given them enough sixty days, so um, that's where I am. So if unless there's any other comments? Commissioners, anyone feel very strongly against this? Okay. I, I, I would, if I was going to go with an extension, it would be 30 days. That's, yeah. that's two commission meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, I could vote for that uh, in the interest of being neighborly. All right. Um, so I think... Uh, moving forward with this continuation, but with a 30-day yeah. max. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Up. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm still getting up to speed. Where are they in the process? Have they prepared <laughs> surveys or engineering plans or any delineation or are they, where are they in that, in the process? Um, so I'll try, yeah, Erin, this is a very long story, but um, yes, there's been many years of that and there's been some pretty important um, revisions requested and updates requested on like actual locations of certain resource boundaries and um, things like that. So this was pending many, many months ago, um, us receiving some updated maps and confirmed locations of updated resource boundaries. Um, things have changed since they first did their resource delineation. Um, which I think was before 2020. So there were some discrepancies about what we understood and what they were showing. And that really was the last time um, we've seen them. So that's what we're waiting for. Um, anything else from that, Erin, that I missed? I, I mean, if, if yeah, it might be a longer conversation that we could get into later if you want the whole story, <laughs> frankly. I think we just need to move on to our next hearing at this point. Um, so... Yeah, I, I was just wondering in the context of of like the professional side of things of what it would take timeline to get a survey or to have a delineation um, prepared. So thirty days if if they were starting from scratch would be kind of a quick turnaround. Yeah, they're not starting they, from scratch that's though. That's not what you're saying. That sounds adequate. Right. Okay. Um, and we've also requested some just uh, sort of proof of moving forward on the items that we've requested. So I, I still think 30 is adequate, Erin. Yes, okay. Yeah, so I just wanna clarify one thing if I could, which is, um, and, and this is kind of a recommended motion. So this is what I'm gonna recommend that the commission do tonight. The commission is taking no action on this matter this evening and allowing 30 days for the applicant to resubmit materials and re-notify abutters or withdraw the application. Sounds good to me. Now I'm looking for a motion. Let me give this a try. I move to uh, continue the uh, hearing. No, we're not continuing it, though. No? Okay. We're so taking no I action. Aaron, Aaron just read the motion. Okay, you can make it. Uh, she didn't put it up in writing. I can't remember every word. So, so I'm just... All right, let me give it another try, then. Um. I move to take no action uh, under uh, the notice of intent DEP file number 0890718 uh, and continue uh, or take no action until uh, 30 days from now, which will be the 10th of uh, April, at which time uh, they uh, the university must have uh, or must have notified abutters and uh, made a um, uh, put an ad in the paper and submitted um, all requested or required materials. It's May, not April. Thank you. May. <laughs> Almost <Thank> perfect, you. <laughs> Andre. <laughs> all right, we have a motion. Second. Second. Alex on the second. Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Hearing number two. Um, abbreviated notice of resource delineation for Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Incorporated, represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site, limited to areas that fall within the 100 foot feet of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9D, lots 11 and 12, and map 9D, lots 27. Okay, so we have many um, public comment for tonight, so I'm going to ask that you start putting your hands up now if you'd like to make a comment. Um, we're going to go first, Aaron, for an update, then we'll go to public comment, and as a reminder, please keep it to two minutes. I will be keeping track, and commissioners, um, please keep your comments to five and just we're going to try and limit the back and forth on this one okay go for it Aaron. so i'm just uh emily stockman is here this evening um she has completed her peer review um i have some additional um uh recommended conditions but 
basically we're prepared to um, issue um, an ORAD this evening if the commission is willing to entertain that. So I'd like to just hand my time over to Emily so she can give sort of a, a brief synopsis of her peer review and where things stand right now. And then um, from there we can uh, take, take the next step. Hi, Emily. I'm just going to um, interject for a second. So just for the public here tonight, what we're doing tonight is um, approving the resource delineation. So there's no site plans as of yet. That will be a notice of intent, which would follow uh, the resource, the approval of the resource area delineation, which is what we're doing tonight. And we've had one resource delineation by the consultant for um, pure Sky Development on behalf of Coles, and then we had a peer review by Emily Stockton, and she is reporting back to us now her results. Thank you. <laughs> Go for it, Emily. Thank you for providing that uh, summary, Michelle. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Emily Stockman. I'm a professional wetland scientist, the owner of Stockman Associates, and I was retained by the commission to perform a peer review of the uh, previously referenced ANRAD. I know you have a full agenda tonight, but you asked for a summary, Aaron. I'm going to be quick, <laughs> um, and then I'll pause and um, make myself available um, for, for questions or any other comments that may come up. Um, so I first began uh, my work on this site back in December. I was able to perform a site visit first solo and then a secondary site visit. I was accompanied um, by uh, the applicant's wetland delineator. Um, subsequent to those two site visits in January of this past year, I issued my first peer review comment letter. It reflected um, observations that I had made in the field as well as um, revisions that I felt were necessary for the site plan. Um, subsequent to that, we received um, revised materials from applicant. I performed a second review of all of those revised materials. Uh, in February, I provided a comment letter uh, to the commission um, acknowledging um, which of my original peer review comments had been addressed and which still remained um, open and in need of attention. Uh, subsequent to that peer review letter, uh, we received um, additional revisions from the applicant. I had an opportunity to review those. Um, I was able to confirm that all of my suge suggested revisions had been made. Um, and I provided the commission with a draft finding of facts that I strongly recommend that they include with their ORAD. Um, this is a complicated uh, ANRAD in, in several ways. There are a number of resource area boundaries um, that the applicant is seeking to have approved. Those include uh, resources subject to, to state protection as well as local bylaw. Um, it's also an interesting ANRAD in that the entire property is not being submitted. Rather, the applicant is only requesting that the commission um, review and approve boundaries within uh, a specified portion of the properties. Um, so I've done my utmost in those draft findings of fact um, to encapsulate language um, that clearly details what the commission is approving under this ORAD, what the commission is not approving under the ORAD. Thanks, Emily. Great. All right, I'm going to go to public comment. I see Luke Vajeri. Um, I I think I need you to oh. allow him to talk, Karen. Yes. Good evening, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. And good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Luke Legere. I'm an attorney with McGregor, Legere, and Stevens in Boston. I represent Jenny Kallick and Robert Bazooka of 147 Shootsbury Road. Our clients are direct abutters to the property west of the subject site. Uh, with me this evening, somewhere out here in the peanut gallery, is David Cameron, a senior professional wetland scientist with Fleetwood Environmental Solutions. Uh, David submitted a letter to the commission ahead of tonight's hearing. 
Um, just really quickly, uh, I just want to explain to the commission uh, sort of who our clients are. Uh, besides being just a butters to the property, they, they do very much support responsibly planned and designed renewable energy products, but they projects, excuse me, but they do have very real concerns regarding the proposed development of this particularly environmentally sensitive site. Uh, as the ANRED makes clear, there are a wide array of jurisdictional wetland resource areas across the property, and those contribute to almost all of the interests that are protected by the State Wetlands Protection Act uh, and by Amherst's local wetlands protection bylaw as well. Um, Mr. Cameron's letter outlines some of the environmental impacts typically associated with conversion of forested hillsides like those found on the site uh, into large scale solar arrays, like what ultimately will be proposed here. Right? We understand that the ANRAD is simply delineating the resource areas, but it's not submitted in a vacuum. Uh, and I think we all know what's coming next. Uh, Mr. Cameron, I should say, is, is hoping to speak for a couple minutes after me as well. Um, but this ANRAD is the first step in the permitting process. Any ORAD issued by the Conservation Commission is gonna set the parameters for the future review of the project itself under a notice of intent. Um, and as Ms. Stockman mentioned, this ANRAD is somewhat unique in that it seeks confirmation of only some resource areas on the site and not all, and there are certainly others. Uh, so we certainly applaud the Commission's decision to retain Stockman Associates as peer review consultants. We very much support the proposed findings and conditions that were mentioned earlier, uh, particularly those which clarify what wetland resource areas are being confirmed by any ORAD and which are not. Um, so without further ado, Madam Chair, if uh, you wouldn't mind, I would like to uh, ask that you acknowledge David Cameron and give him an opportunity to present briefly as well. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Luke. I'm gonna go in order of the hands raised. Um, so next I have, Alexandra, I'm going to allow you to talk. Two minutes, please. Okay, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, um, my name is Alexandra Balunas. Um, I'm a resident of 201 Shootsbury Road. Um, I just recently learned about this from my parents. I've been traveling and having some health issues. Um, I've gone on probably 100,000 hikes across the Coles land since I was born. I've, I've lived there. And there are, there's many endangered species um, back there on the, the land that aren't in delineated wetland resource areas. They're on hillsides. Um, like there's a very beautiful orchid um, called the small world Pongonia. Um, that can only grow in very, very limited conditions. Um, and there's not, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, I could list off many, many things that are in those backwoods. Obviously, Western Massachusetts is full of many beautiful, you know, forests. Um, I guess my point is I just strongly object to this. My family also has uh, geothermal heating. This would affect uh flow for that water it requires a certain level of water flow to the home um, for it to be effective like i i'm sure other properties have similar issues in the area there's an intermittent stream directly at the entrance between the two properties that directly about this um, development i i just like i i know that we need more solar obviously but this is not the this is not a location that makes any sense to me at all um and i would strongly suggest that we find another location that perhaps doesn't have as many endangered species and wetlands just completely dotted around in this development it's just I don't know. It seems senseless to me personally. And I wish I knew more about it before coming into this. Um, but I mean, I would love to find uh, more information on why this location would have been selected by Coles. It simply doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, next, we have Corey from Pure Sky. I'm going to allow you to talk. Please keep it to two minutes. 
Well, I'll give you five, I guess. <laughs> this is our project proponent. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, good evening to the board. Uh, my name is Corey McCandless. I am the project manager um, representative of Pure Sky Energy. The applicant um, that has, you know, that is here this evening. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to um, entertain our application. And as Mrs. Stockman has already outlined, there's been quite a bit of back and forth <laughs> between um, our consultant with Goddard. And we've been, you know, doing our best in supporting Goddard in making sure that, you know, everything has been peer reviewed, everything has been fact checked. And so we are very yeah. confident. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and so we are very confident in the ANRAD that is in front of you this evening um, it is, you know, set, you know, grounded in science and it is what it is. Um, I wanted to address a couple of um, points that the uh, previous speakers brought up. And this is really just to, you know, educate um, the public at large because these projects are complex. They um, involve, you know, a lot of consideration. Um, if we if we could find sites and we actively look for sites that are already cleared so we don't have to cut down trees, um, it, it's you know it, it's not something that we enjoy either. The, rea the reality is that the constraints that we have to work within to site these projects are really limited to the existing infrastructure. So in your neck of the woods, you have Eversource and you have National Grid. These projects are interconnecting to National Grid's infrastructure. And unfortunately, those lines and those substations um, are incredibly expensive to move or to build out. So it's, it's really, you know, we really are limited to the existing infrastructure. And that is, you know, what that means is those those lines and the substation that I mentioned, um, they they are those are the only ones that we can interconnect to. So I'd be happy to speak on that more, um, but I I don't want to take up too much time. Um, the the last point that I'll make is, um, you know, we we have we have actually gone out and you know surveyed the wetlands in the surrounding areas. Um, of the site, um, larger than what you have in front of you. Um, we, including the Adams Brook, uh, that was asked to be removed from the application because um, that scope of review is what was review, you know, reviewed by the peer reviewer. So we do have that information. Um, we can provide it to the commission at large, but um, I think what that will come to is during the NOI process. Um, I'm still acquainting myself with the process in Massachusetts on, um, you know, an ANRAD to an ORAD, but, um, you know, we, we did flag the stream and in order to establish that uh, wetland buffer zone, so we could avoid, you know, we will avoid that area. Um, so anyway, I, I can make my contact information available if, if any members from the public um, would like to, you know, contact me with these questions or concerns. Um, and I believe we have um, Goddard from the consulting agency um, on the line. And I also believe that Mr. Tom Reedy will be joining us as well. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Corey, um, for the information and your offer to speak to the public. Maybe um, if there's any members of the public that want to take you up on that, they can contact Aaron through the town of Amherst to get your contact information. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to Fleetwood Environmental Solutions. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me OK? We can. Great. Um, first, thanks for entertaining my comments and also just thank you for what you guys do. I know it's not easy. Um, I'll do the best I can to keep this to two minutes and follow your panels. I think I can keep it to two minutes. Um, I've got six specific comments here, which are an attempt to boil down the five page letter that I submitted to the commission on Monday. 
Uh, my clients are downhill butters, and this again is Jenny Kalik and Robert Brazuka. They're downhill butters to what we understand is going to be a solar project that prompted the filing of this ANRAD. Um, as Attorney Legier indicated, they are supporters of renewable energy projects, including solar, as am I. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of my most important clients are solar developers, so I do understand this um, type of project very well. Um, they do have, however, legitimate concerns regarding how clearing and developing this site may end up inadvertently and negatively affecting their property, as well as the site's resource areas and downstream resource areas. Uh, some of which include cold water fishery re resources, property habitats or rare species, and estimated habitats of rare wildlife. <clears throat> um, number three is my opinion you, is you hired a very solid peer reviewer and Stockman Associates. Um, I've followed the correspondence between Stockman and the applicant's consultant, Goddard consultant, very closely over the past several months. I think Stockman's comments have been very insightful. And my impression is Goddard has made an earnest attempt to adequately address Stockman's comments. Um, I can tell you from firsthand experience, the amount of labor hours that these two firms must have put into this effort were substantial. And that's an understatement. They put a lot of time into this. Um, I, did a, I did find um, a few discrepancies in the file materials. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but I would request that you focus on my comments regarding establishing a formal quote-unquote study area as a, as a much neater and cleaner way of geographically and clearly indicating what this ANRAD actually covers and what any subsequent ORAD covers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I would also ask that you look at my comments regarding Eastern Hemlock and how that plays into the delineation and how it was represented on the delineation data forms. Uh, Fleetwood supports Stockman suggested or had findings. I think they were really well crafted and they're very important. Um, number six, and this is my last comment, I will plead with you to read the discussion section of my letter. I just don't have the time to go into what I wrote in there, but in short, it's about constructions and construction based stormwater and getting that right. Um, it outlines some of the inherent challenges these types of landforms present when it comes to stormwater management. And I made these comments not just for the commission's benefit, but also for the applicant's benefit and for the property owner's benefit. Um, if things go off the rails with stormwater during the construction phase, it's often very, very difficult and time consuming, sometimes years to get things back on track. Um, and it will cause a lot of unnecessary environmental damage and could cause damage to the, the abutting properties. I believe that's it. I apologize for not saying who I was up front. David Cameron, Fleetwood Environmental Solutions. I'm from 84 Russell Street in Hadley. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, yes, and thank you for your comments on Emily's uh, report. Commissioners, I hope everybody had a chance to review those, but um, we do appreciate that. And um, we'll talk about that now. Okay, I think everybody has had a chance, who has their hand up. So commissioners, questions and comments. Bruce, go ahead. So in the findings of fact attachment, um, there are several references to possible state jurisdiction in contrast to, it says local and possible state in contrast to local and state, meaning it's already assumed. Can Aaron or someone else describe the, what it means that it's possible and what's the potential that it becomes uh, actualized? Emily, do you want to heal that one? No, thank you, Bruce. I'm happy to discuss that terminology there. I believe that the four resource areas that um, or excuse me, one, two, the six resource areas that you're referring to are protected, isolated, vegetated wetlands under the um, local um, bylaw. The um, applicant um, had stated in, I think it was their first response letter, <laughs> um, that they did not evaluate the isolated vegetated wetlands to ascertain whether or not they would also meet the jurisdictional definition for isolated land subject to flooding 
under our state regulations. Um, so they have they had clearly acknowledged that they did not go through that exercise and that they were not seeking approval for isolated land subject to flooding. Um, and so that is why the jurisdiction is listed as possible state. It's undetermined and would be undetermined um, based on your ORED. Okay. I have lots of questions about that. Um, commissioners? Um, so in those cases, are we giving it the benefit of the doubt of the greatest protection? Or we this remains uncertain until the NOI comes when it, it is, is it gonna be resolved in the meantime? I guess, what's the plan for that? How would we evaluate that when we have the NOI in front of us? Uh, Michelle, if I may respond, sure. um, the um, whether or not the applicant or landowner chooses to proceed with that assessment um, um, at the time of the notice of intent or at an in-between stage, like Corey just was referring to in terms of the delineation of Abbey Brook, I can't speak to that. Um, what I can say is that the findings in the order clearly state um, that there are additional resource areas within not only the property, but the area of review that have not been submitted, reviewed, or approved. And one of the things that the commission needs to be cognizant of is that under the ANRAD process, the applicant is coming before you voluntarily seeking approval of boundaries. And those are boundaries that they have presented to you. Um, so at the, this stage, um, to address the presence of additional boundaries that are not being requested for review, the findings I feel are the strongest way to ensure that when the project gets to NOI phase, if any work is proposed with an area that is not subject to this ORAD, the applicant will have the burden of proof to vet those additional resource areas, delineate them and submit those boundaries for the commission's review and approval. Thanks, Emily. And just for comments to the commissioners, um, we are again, just reviewing boundaries and not our buffers because in some cases these, like what Emily was saying, haven't been determined as to what they, fall under. So that might come later down the line. And that's part of the finding of fact that these are just boundaries and not buffers, the buffers which are dependent on what type of wetland they might be. So that is not what we're not deciding on the buffers tonight that comes later down the line. It's the boundaries of the wetlands themselves. Bruce, go ahead. Well, just so we're clear, the, what you just referred to is part six and seven on page two of the findings of fact. And then it, each one of those has, I don't know, six different descriptors of what's not being um, included. Okay. I'm asking. You're just confirming or asking me. Confirmation that this this sheet that we've been reading is what we're talking about. Yes, finding a fact. Okay. Erin, go ahead. Yeah, so just to further piggyback on what Emily was saying, like, for example, um, when a notice of intent comes in, there are, there's two jurisdictions that the commission oversees. There's the Wetland Protection Act and there's our local wetland bylaw. So the jurisdiction will be determined, you know, when, when the notice of intent is filed, whether it's jurisdictional under state or local law will need to be determined at that time. So to Emily's point, if there are resource areas that have not been defined or um, investigated to determine whether or not they in actually fall under state jurisdiction, uh, that documentation would need to be provided to the commission so we could make that determination if it did fall under state jurisdiction or not at that time. So just wanted to make sure that that's clear. So when we're issuing, we're issuing both under state and local. And so when we get to that point, um, that's that's kind of another nuance of of what um, those finding of fact um, tease apart is 
uh, what where we have definitive answers of what's jurisdictional and where there are still outstanding questions of what's jurisdictional under state. Thanks, Erin. Um, and just to be clear, so there were a number of revisions requested that uh, David had suggested and uh, the applicant has agreed to incorporate those. So in our motion, do we have an updated one? I'm just trying to confirm that the motion is dependent on those, okay, with noted additional comments. Is that what that's referring to? Right. So, okay. um, yeah, I I did read the comments that came um, from um, Mr. Cameron. And um, so the first thing is that we did receive an updated um, uh, application form already that has uh, the check boxes in the um, I think it was saturated and inundated conditions were, was one of the check boxes that was missed and also contains the landowner's um, information. However, that was received late this afternoon. So I haven't had a chance to like go through it and verify that it's, you know, <laughs> apples to apples, exactly what was submitted to us before, just with the new information on it. So I haven't yet shared that with the commission, but we did receive it. So these two outstanding um, Again, I have them listed here as additional possible conditions for consideration um, of approval. And um, one of these is a comment that I had, which is that on the plan set, the final plan set only contains the original plan date, which was February 12th. It doesn't contain any of the subsequent plan revision dates or the final revision date. And so um, my, my recommend recommended condition here is that the commission require a revision to be submitted um, as part of the ORAD approval, which would, um, the final plan, stamped plan set would include the original plan date, the subsequent revisions, and the final revision date so that it was clear on the ORAD um, that all those dates were accurate based on the revisions that were made to the plans from the original submission. And then the second condition that's listed here is that the is the condition basically a verbatim that Mr. Cameron suggested, which is that um, the plan include a simple, continuous, bold, boundary labeled ANRAD study area um, to specifically and graphically make clear what portions of the property are subject to the ANRAD. So that's also a recommended condition here. I did speak with Goddard Consulting about this earlier today, um, letting them know these this additional submission would need to be submitted to us before we can issue the ORAD. And I let them know that if they were in favor of us approving it with these conditions, that they would need to grant the commission a, um, if, if it's not get, if the materials, the updated materials are not received by us within 21 days so we can issue the ORAD that they would need to grant us an extension to that 21 day um, issuance requirements so that we can close the public hearing tonight. So I wanted to ask the applica applicants if they're willing to confirm on the record that if the materials come to us um, after 21 days, that they grant us an extension so that we can issue the ORAD after that period. Um, yeah, thanks, Erin. Corey, I see your hand up. So you want to respond to that real quick? As yes. In a granting of our 21 day extension. Yep. Yep, we can do that. Erin, did um, that most recent edition that we sent over to you, I thought that did include the ANRAD study area labels. Yeah, so it included the exclusion areas, but not a, um, a polygon around the ANRAD study area, which I think is what was referenced in the comment letter that the commission received. So I was, again, trying to sort of... Um, keep us on track to approve tonight, but also sort of incorporate some of the public comments so that it was clear we're taking that into consideration. Um, but yeah, that was the issue. It was just a, a bold border around the NRAD study area on the plan set. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely um, make that, those updates and get those over to you well within 21 days. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, um, commissioners, any further comments? Rachel, go ahead. I had a question. I wanted to clarify that within the ANRAB study area um, to make sure there weren't additional resource areas that are being excluded. Um, 
maybe I'll let Emily take that one. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Rachel, I think I understand your question. So um, the plans as they stand now, rather than demarcating the boundary of the area subject to the ANRAD, um, Goddard took a different approach and designated what areas were not subject to it. Um, with this revision, a final site plan will both clearly identify what areas are not um, subject to the ANRAD and ORAD and, and what areas are. Um, so a little redundancy there, but never a bad thing when we're talking about final site plans and wanting to make sure um, important information is, is well depicted and um, articulated. As far as whether or not there are additional protected resource areas within the study area, yes, there are. Um, we talked a little bit about isolated land subject to flooding. The applicant chose not to run that analysis to demonstrate protection. Um, another example I can think of is vernal pool. The applicant has acknowledged that there are vernal pool depressions within the area. They opted to not delineate those boundaries and the subsequent vernal pool habitat envelope under the bylaw. So the findings of fact identify those resources as well as others within the study area that have not been determined. <clears throat> okay. And then if I could, Michelle and Aaron, just cause I do have to chime in procedurally. <laughs> uh, I understand the commission's desire to move forward with this. There's been a lot of time and effort put into it. I'm sure the applicant is also looking forward to an ORAD. Um, I cannot keep silent on the concept of closing a hearing prior to having final plans for review. So I would say another option is that all parties based on this evening's discussion are aware of the additional revision the commission is looking for. Um, the applicant could agree to a continuance knowing that those revisions would be at the next meeting. It would then be, I don't wanna jinx anything, but a fairly quick agenda item with all the ducks in a row while the public hearing process is still open and you could have your formal vote at your next meeting to close the hearing and issue the ORAD. Okay, and so you're just, you mean to incorporate um, the study area and all the said suggested changes? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, you heard the alternative commissioners. Alex, go ahead. Um, I like the alternative that Emily just suggested, but I, and I just say that, but I want to ask uh, Aaron and maybe Emily, is the ORAD incomplete? If we have resources that are not in there because the applicant decided not to put them in there, such as vernal pools, such as land subject to flooding, is it a a complete document or and or does it have holes in it and if it has holes in it uh what would be the next steps well the vernal pools are on the plans but they haven't been confirmed but under lo state law we can consider them to be vernal pools um with the impression that they are potential vernal pools so as far as isolated land subject to flooding, um, that one I'm less clear about. Go ahead, Erin. So Alex, we can only confirm what the applicant is asking us to confirm. We can't say to them, you have to confirm all these other boundaries as well. They come to us and they say, this is the area where we want confirmation. These are the resources we want confirmed. We say, okay, we'll confirm the resources that you've asked for in the study area that you've asked for, but we can't confirm anything outside of that study area. We can't confirm anything that you have not asked for confirmation of. So that is where sort of our hands are tied in terms of um, what action we can take. Any other comments, commissioners? Bruce. Well then down the line, how do we protect something that hasn't been delineated or confirmed if it's like like these vernal pools how do we protect them in the other steps of the process 
The vernal pools will get their 100 foot buffer um, because they've already been identified as vernal pools. And some of that was sort of nomenclature on the map. But um, Emily, go ahead. You, looks like yeah, you want to respond. Sure. That's, that's an excellent question. So when, when this property moves from an ORAD phase to a notice of intent phase, the commission's authority um, to require more information expands. Instead of it being an ANRAD um, really defined um, by, by the applicant and limiting what you're reviewing, under the NOI process, you are going to be provided with a project area and you will absolutely have the authority to require the identification and delineation of resource area boundaries not set by this ORAD. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. Okay, any further comments? I see Corey's hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. My my apologies for that. Um, I realize you need to click lower hand after you've raised it. Um, so I I guess I, I just have one question is, um, Mrs. Stockman, are you suggesting that we continue the hearing tonight um, with the plan for the next ConCon meeting to not be to not be a public hearing? or to, that it would, I, I guess I'm confused around it. I mean, it sounded like the conditions that Ms. Jake outlined were simply administrative changes to the plans that we have submitted. Um, and I, we, you know, we, we do have this project going through our CBA process and we would really appreciate a meaningful update to send to staff and to the board there. Um, so I, I guess if you could, kindly walk me through the order of operations and what you're suggesting to the commission. Okay, hold on a second. Um, I think that the commission has, you know, something in front of us that was suggested by Aaron. Emily has suggested an alternative, which is to continue it with all said revisions are until we have all said revisions. What the motion is on our PowerPoint tonight is to issue this with our 21 days to get us those revisions. And if they don't do that, then we get an extension until they have submitted it. I personally am comfortable with that. I have faith in this applicant that they will give this to us. I see Emily's point that um, there's uncertainty that we don't have the plan in front of us, but I think the, the communication has been good on both ends. And I think everything is understood about what we want. So, um, Commissioners, if you have any further concerns about that, if anybody wants to give one last um, comment on, yep, yeah, I see you, Alex, um, whether or not they're ready to move ahead. Yeah, maybe just a few seconds, Alex, give us your stance. I would like to have a complete document in front of us to approve. And so far we do not, given the suggestions that that uh, Aaron has had, and if it wouldn't take but one more meeting to have a complete document in front of us, I favor that. Okay, I mean, we do this all the time, just to be clear. We issue this with um, some pending revisions and the project applicant has agreed to put all these in as far as I understand, and they're not big asks, they're a polygon around the resource um, and some other inclusions that everyone had a chance to review. Bruce, go ahead. Aaron, can you go back to slide four? Slide four, number that one. I just wanna reiterate again, the thing in yellow, because it, it seems like, oh, not this applicant necessarily, but over and over again, Aaron tells us that she has received something in the afternoon of this meeting, of, of, of a Wednesday night meeting. And we are trying really hard to get the materials with adequate time so that everyone has the things to look at and they're all complete. And here's an example of where it isn't complete. Thank you. Andre. Thanks for your patience. Um, I don't really have a problem with uh, with 
with going ahead and approving it right now. Thanks, Andre. Um, I'm gonna do a show of hands then. Who's ready to move on this tonight? All right, we're kind of short here tonight. So that's a 50-50 and I don't think we can pass it. Um, so in that case, it looks like we're gonna have to continue this um, until we have a full plan in front of us. Um, and with that, I'm looking for, okay, Corey, we're gonna get you some clear guidance on this, but I think you know what you need. So if you could just take one minute to respond and then we're gonna make a motion to continue. Okay, thank you. Um, it, just one last thing is um, I understand that there was, there's a missing commissioner um, to the meeting tonight, uh, Mr. Jason, and then um, Mr. Alex had missed a previous meeting. So I'm just um, trying to be mindful of the Mullins rule um, for the next hearing if, um, if in, in terms of how many folks you'll need to ha to in order to vote. Um, yeah, we have two missing voting members tonight. So I think, you know, that's kind of unusual for us. But is anyone here planning on not is not being here for our next meeting as far as you know? Yeah. Okay, I'm, Andre. I'm sorry, but but I don't I don't really think that that's an appropriate question for uh, uh I mean from from Corey. I did. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, Corey, sorry, we're just gonna, we don't have the votes to move tonight anyway, so we're just gonna have to continue on. Alex, do you have one last thing? Yeah, say. for the record, I notified Aaron and Michelle yeah. tonight that I did watch the previous hearing that I missed, and I watched it in full, so I met the rule. Okay. All right, um, commissioners, I am then looking for a motion to continue Shrewsbury Road. Um, where is okay, I move to issue a continuation of the public hearing for Shrewsbury Road ORAD to 424 24 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Um, we will see you in two weeks or second. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, for the for the record, is Rachel abstaining or unable to vote? How how do we describe that? She's unable to vote. Thank you. And thank you so much, Emily, too, for coming tonight. Really appreciate your time. And Yeah, uh, thanks, Emily. I learned something tonight. Appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> and for your thorough review of this project. We appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank Good you, night. everyone, for your time and your efforts. Okay. Moving on. To a notice of intent for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLS e Fornex LLC LLC and WD Coles Incorporated for the construction of a battery storage system associated with access road improvements, stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road, Route 63, Map 2A, Lot 18. I saw Eric Anderson. Um, anyone here for this, please raise your hand so we can pull you in. What was your question, Michelle? I just asked anyone representing this project to raise their hand so I could pull Thank them you. in. And I just brought in Eric. Welcome, Eric. OK, um, Aaron, would you like to give us the update on this one? Yes. So um, we have received a um, uh, proposal um, from Lodestar for an invasive species management plan, which has been, um, it's in your uh, your OneDrive folders for your review. I believe it was received after the Wednesday date, so you may not have had a chance to review it thoroughly. So um, just to, to note that, I think what Eric is here primarily for this evening is to get some clarification on um, staking the site to meet the commission's um, 
uh, sort of requirements so that when they do a site visit this next time around that um, uh, their needs are met. But I think, um, and just to sort of summarize, I know Alex had sent um, a request to me via email, which was forwarded to Lodestar um, requiring or requesting some pretty substantial staking requirements of the site. And I'll let Eric speak to this, but it was pr substantially expensive and a little more in depth than what we typically require for an application. So uh, he wants to kind of get a read from the commission of what um, other commissions commissioners feel would be adequate to be able to um, conduct a site visit and understand what's going on on the site um, prior to the site visit being scheduled, which is pending and hopefully will happen prior to the next um, meeting. So that's that's my update. Thanks, Sarah. And if there's any public comment, please raise your hand and we keep an eye on the room. Um, commissioners, or actually Eric, yeah, um, I just wanna say that thank you for the updated mitigation plan. I did not have a chance to look at it yet. So we're gonna have to continue just to give us time and to get out on the site. So I think what we're here to talk about, like Aaron said, is the staking, um, which will help us with the site visit. So um, yeah, do you wanna talk or do you wanna let us give you some questions first? <laughs> uh, I know this is gonna be a bit of a discussion. Yeah, uh, I'll just like quickly say my piece and then I guess fill in the gaps while you're having the conversation. Um, totally understand that I didn't meet the deadline for the invasive species management proposal. Um, we've been working with a local firm, Oxbow Associates, to get that. And uh, as soon as I got it, I sent it over to Aaron. Unfortunately, it was after that Wednesday um, deadline. Uh, but just to quickly state that we've, uh, we've heard your concerns about what our proposed mitigation was we're extending the term of mitigation for the term of the project. And we are looking to increase the scope of the work being completed to everything west of Eastman Brook, which is on the property. So it's about six acres of invasive species management. Um, our, our proposed project is uh, 9,000 square feet in the wetland buffer zone. Um, about 6.15 acres is being proposed, which is about 267,000 square feet on the property being managed. Um, so just wanted to highlight that and we can have a more in-depth conversation once everyone's had the opportunity to review it. Uh, but getting to the site staking, um, I received an email from Aaron, um, I guess forwarding along some information that Alex had been asking for in regards to um, what we were currently showing on the site plan and out at the site. Uh, all of the information that I've Alex is asking for, I believe, is in the site plan. Um, so just to speak specifically to you, Alex, um, what I can do is all of the things you're asking for us to include in the site plan, I can address them, say, like in a document pointing out each resource where it is in the site plan. If that would help orient you, I'm happy to do it. Um, the second, I know there's a lot in like a, a small area and it can be hard to read with so many colored lines. <laughs> so uh, we can do that. Okay. And the um, the second part of this is what we're going to be staking out in the field. Um, Alex has asked that we stake certain um, things like a 100 foot buffer area, uh, but also 50 foot buffer area, 30 foot buffer area, um, without any real limit as to where those stakes would end. Uh, presumably, those stakes wouldn't go off the property or to the property line, given how large this particular property is. Um, also, some of this, uh, it, Aaron, as Aaron said, it is pretty expensive to do. So I was just looking for some guidance from the commission uh, tonight. That way we can line up the work that needs to be done. And again, we're happy to provide whatever the commission needs, uh, but obviously just seeking some clarity before we go and kick off that work. Thanks, Eric. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, just for clarity, you happened to mention the 100 foot buffer and the other lines. I did sit down with your plan. My concern is that we're going to have a site visit where many people will be there that have never been on that site before. It is complicated. You've got Eversource, um, you've got your project. And what happens in a site visit is somebody like you stands there and says, well, this is over here and this is over there and you've got a few stakes around for example your access road coming down eversource there's i think 
maybe five at most stakes on where that road is. And for somebody standing there who's new, it's really difficult to figure out where the project is on the ground. So carrying a plan in your hand without identifying where something is on the ground doesn't do it. And um, our chair hasn't been on site, other people haven't on site, and we're gonna be asked to uh, make a decision. So you've already staked out where these things are in order to make your plan. And while I appreciate Aaron telling me that it's too expensive, um, that doesn't fly with me. And I want the commission when it shows up, because I think this project has gotten so much air that probably a lot of commissioners will show up. And I think our chair intends to show up. Um, so I, I would like, I even asked for the stakes to be painted on top rather than flagged. I've seen that done. And, uh, I just want the, um, everything from where a fire truck would have to go to the access road to your site, uh, coming off Eversource, where your poles are going to be, where the trench is going to be. Uh, you happen to mention the hundred foot buffer and the blah, blah, blah. I'm more interested in, I am interested in where the buffer is, but the whole project's inside the 100 foot buffer. And I'm more interested in where the project is gonna be on the ground. So somebody showing up who's never been there before can very quickly get a feel for what we're talking about. And there are more, people use more than, than one sense to, to learn. And when somebody's standing there talking, we're only using our ears. I'd like to engage the eyes, two senses, by staking things out in a in a way that's pretty clear. So um, um, the amount of and and you said that it would be expensive, and Aaron said it would be expensive. Compared to what? I I, I think. What you're asking us to do is understand your project, and I'm I'm I I spent probably an hour and a half putting that list together, studying your plan. I think I probably spent more time than most commissioners looking at that plan, and um, I find it difficult to figure out where it is. I even went with your plan down to the site to try and figure out where things were, and then I came home and wrote that 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 note to Aaron. So um, it was with the best interest of the commission that I asked for that, for that, for the site visit to be in, as informative as it possibly can be. And the only way I could think about doing it is staking things. Thanks, Alex. Um, I see that you want to respond to that, uh, Eric. Can, can I just offer maybe an alternative? And with, do you have GIS data for this that we could look at a tablet and be on site and see where we are and be in a hundred foot zone? I mean, that is how I would do it in the field is to be on like arc or something and, you know, be able to track my movement through. And that seems like a really, really cheap and easy visual alternative to what Alex is, is suggesting. Is that a possibility? Um, it's definitely a possibility. I can look into it. I know when I'm walking sites, I use an app called Land Glide on my phone that overlays things like property boundaries, resource areas to show where you are in proximity. Um, so I can definitely look into something like ArcGIS and, you know, trying to use that when we're all out there. Um, and just to respond to Alex, uh, I think that we can do a better job staking things out. I think your comments make a lot of sense. And I didn't mean any, you know, anything bad by saying it was expensive. I'm more saying that like it's a it's a good it's a good sized undertaking. And I want to make sure that we get it correct the first time, especially given, you know, the timing of a site visit and everything like that. I want to make sure that I get 100 percent correct the full scope of work that you're requesting, that it makes sense to me and that if we schedule a site visit before the, you know, the commission's next meeting, that it, it's meeting your expectations and the rest of the commissions. Okay, Alex, is there like a, a critical core requirement that you would have for the staking that might be 
more, you know, he, he might be able to address in a more timely manner or that would still allow us to orient ourselves on the ground and, but maybe not the complexity that you, that you wrote up. Michelle, have you read, read my note? I did not. I have a sick child at home and do, I did not do, do my homework. Do me a favor and read my note before you ask me that question. Okay. Well, I appreciate the uh, need to be able to see things on the ground, but it sounds like we need to find some compromise here to to make it all happen for a site visit coming up soon so i i <clears throat> um i find it difficult that you are asking me to compromise what i wrote when you haven't read it okay well you're hearing some feedback from staff and eric so maybe some other commissioners could weigh in on alex's comment and especially if you've been to the site Good. I saw Bruce's hand up, but it's down, so I'll go to Andre. Yeah, just uh, Alex, do you have any thoughts on the tablet idea? Would that know. work? I don't own one. Erin has one, and no, she has no, ARC it, on it, so that's it, something that we could do in the field with Erin. Yeah, so let's suppose that you have one in hand. Would that, uh, would that help you? Or would that... If I could speak to Andre's, um, I think the I think the buffers are pretty probably. I mean, those stakes don't need to be five feet apart. I'm not as concerned about um, how how many stakes are in the ground for the buffers. I'm more in, interested in the the project elements and where they are on the ground. There's connection poles that are difficult to understand. There's going to be construction areas that um, 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 Jason asked about the ditching, for example, the last time we talked about this. And um, that's not hard to stake a ditch. Um, um, and you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna have a road for the fire truck. And I don't know whether Eversource will allow you to use their right of way uh, they must use some of their right away to get a fire truck in there, but you told us that they will not allow a hammerhead on their right away. So you got to put it someplace else. Where's it going to be? Um, I just so I, you were putting emphasis on the wetland buffers. Uh, I, I I'm happy to to. I'm more interested in having the elements of the project staked out clearly. Um, you, for example, you've got stakes where the battery's going to be, and then on your plan it says disturbed area. And when I went to the site, I couldn't tell one from the other. Um, so I, the emphasis to me, and I, I put a lot of care into making that list. Uh, you know, the the amount of ink that it takes to write hundred foot buffer is the same as it does to name something else. Um, and but I, I don't need stakes 10 feet apart for the 100 foot buffer. It, it's, it's a long ways, you're inside it. So, um, um, so my emphasis would be on the project elements. When, so make it really easy for people to figure out where it is. Like, like if you had cutouts that you could lay on the ground. <laughs> You know, something like that's ridiculous. I know all I could think of is stakes. If you've got an easier way, you want to use spray paint. I don't really care. My objective is for people to show up and in a short amount of time, identify where the project is and try and hold the group together because what happens on site visits is they're often splinters and we get side conversations going on. And not everybody can hear what everybody's saying. So um, I was just trying to figure out how to make this site visit most efficient. And that's to plainly show where the project elements are. OK, uh, thanks, that's, Alex. That's I'm going to, Bruce, go ahead. As the only other commissioner who I think was in this meeting who's been out there on a site visit, I concur with Alex that it's confusing. And since it's all already inside the 100 foot buffer that I would like to support his effort to get more as much clarity as possible by some mechanism that works for people. OK, well, I'm still a fan of doing this digitally. I think it might be easier to 
visualize on a tablet and seeing our geographic location. So, you know, I think you're hearing from the commissioners that this is a confusing plan set to refer to when you're on the site and that in order to evaluate what's going on, we're going to need more clarity and we're offering you two ways to do it. Um, go ahead, Eric. I, yeah, I, so I don't see why we can't pursue both. Uh, it's my intention too to make what we're proposing clear. So I'll connect with Aaron and see, you know, what we can do on a tablet. At the same time, we'll, you know, get the people lined up to stake the site in the way that Alex and Bruce are wanting to see. And I imagine the rest of the commission would want to see. Um, just to confirm, I understand the majority of the project is in the buffer. However, um, about 18% of it is outside of it. So just wanted to set the record straight. And then the other part of it is a lot of these elements are staked out. The issue is that it's, you know, your standard staking where a surveyor is writing on the side of a stake what it, what, you know, it's trying to mark up. Um, and, you know, when you're set back from all of this, it just looks like a bunch of stakes that are out there. You can't really clearly see. So I think, you know, painting the tops of those stakes, trying to get creative with like what, uh, maybe using like flags of different colors to show things, um, we'll get creative and we'll do our best. And uh, we'll also make it fair and, and reasonable at the same time. Like Alex is saying, we don't need every you know, five feet staked. So um, we'll get the job done and, and hopefully make everyone happy. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Appreciate that. Bruce, go ahead. Done, okay. All right, I'm not seeing any public comments, but it sounds like, um, we have an understanding here and thank you for being accommodating. I do look forward to getting out on that site and knowing what I'm looking at um, one way or another. Um, so with that, I'm looking for a motion to continue. Chris, you're muted in case you're making a motion. No. Okay. Continue the public hearing for the Montague Road Battery Storage Project DEP 0890731 to uh, April 24th at 7.35 p.m. Second. Bruce on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I. Thanks, Eric. We'll be Thank in you. touch. Have a good one. Eight. Okay. And I have open. I'm opening this one, right, Aaron? Okay. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is an abbreviated, abbreviated Notice of Resource Area Delineation for SWCA Environmental Consultants on behalf of Amherst College for the Confirmation of Resource Area Boundaries of Bordering Vegetated Wetland and Bank for a portion of 0 and 151 College Streets, Map 14B and 14D, Lots 165 and 1, encompassing approximately 4.1 acres. Okay, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand and I'm going to keep an eye on it. Um, do we have a project proponent here tonight named Darren Gray? You're your muted, Darren. Up. Your hands up, Michelle. Uh, Darren is the um, uh, engineer from Amherst College, um, and Meredith is the um, wetlands consultant. Could I just give a, a yeah. quick um, intro before um, they jump in, which is uh, we had a site visit on uh, the 2nd of April. Um, Bruce and Rachel uh, joined, which was great. Um, my screen just went haywire. Sorry about that. Um, based on the site visit, there were several flag adjustments that were made, and um, there was a plan set which was updated and provided to me yesterday. So um, that is only just 
updated in your packet and so obviously not submitted by the required deadline. So I don't expect that we're going to be taking any action tonight, but the applicant did want an opportunity to present um, a couple just quick notes. And I think this would be things for the that might help expedite um, at the next hearing, which are um, just as the request on the previous ANRAD, a polygon that clearly uh, delineates the limits of the study area would be recommended to add to the plan figure um, in advance of the next meeting so that we don't have to deal with another go round of revisions after the next meeting. The other thing just for the commission's knowledge is that um, the bordering vegetated wetland north of the Faring Brook was not delineated as part of, part of this ORAD, so that will need to be included in the findings of fact that are associated with the ORAD. Um, those are my only comments at this point, so just... Um, Thanks, Erin. Anybody else wants to present? Um, Darren, Meredith, one of you want to present? Uh, I'll give a, a quick hello and then turn over to Meredith for presenting, but um, I'm Darren Gray. Capital Project Manager for Amherst College. I'm also a professional civil engineer. Um, first of all, thank you to the Conservation Commission and um, Aaron and Commissioners uh, Alex and Rachel for joining us on the site walk. It was nice to meet you all. Uh, of course, our purpose today, just like the other again about, is to review our wetlands delineation. Um, it was a very thorough walkthrough. I know there are only minor adjustments uh, in the field. And um, just complete clar clarity here, you know, Amherst College are requesting this wetlands re limits review and approval to inform um, our ongoing design efforts uh, for a ground source geothermal system to decarbonize our campus. Um, we plan to come forward later this year with a detailed notice of intent. Um, so once we are able to lock in these wetlands limits via the approval, we can then kind of finalize our, our permitting drawings and come before the board. And when we do that, you'll see that the entire project has been, will be within previously disturbed limits. Um, but again, just wanted to complete uh, clarity here on what we're up, what's going on on the site. Um, but, you know, I look forward to doing that more detailed review with review with you all in the NOI process. But I will just turn it over to Meredith. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Meredith? Hi, good evening, everyone. Meredith Bornstein, SWCA, professional wetland scientist. Um, would it be possible to share my screen or? OK, great. I will show you the first plan we submitted, oh, we'll share, and then the updated plan. Actually, can everyone see, this is, if I toggle back and forth, can you see a plan? Um, we can see it, yeah. You can see that one, okay. Yeah, this was the original plan. As you can see, the site is, um, south of College Street and the it's the Amherst College existing um, energy facility production area and um, most of it's developed but there are some forested wetlands along the edges of the property um, and so we flagged the bank of it's actually Fearing Brook that comes out of a culvert and it's mostly underground until it comes out of this culvert and so we flagged that bank um, yeah, Aaron was saying there's a there's a wetland over here somewhere on I think it's probably on these other folks' property. We didn't flag, um, and because it didn't have the buffer zone, wouldn't be cast on our potential work area. So we're not asking for um, confirmation of any wetlands over on this side um, of the property. And then so yeah, it's just a forested wetland. This is wetland one. Um, and it's not connected to this other bordering vegetated wetland, um, wetland two, just so you know, we just flagged the limits of the wetland relative to the parking lot. So the wetland does extend uh, um, into the forest to the south here, um, but we're not asking for confirmation of those wetland flags. And then if I can just show you, um, so we did the site visit and that was really helpful. And I made, um, I was able to pick up the points in the field and make those adjustments. So we adjusted two flags um, on wetland one, just connecting, abandoning um, 
flags 118, 119, 120, and 21, and connecting 117 to 118 R, which R stands for relocated. Um, you can see 132 R is relocated here. Um, and it was really great. Aaron and I went back and forth and figured this stuff out. So that was really helpful. And then this other wetland got a little bit bigger and we extended it um, north a little bit and just to encompass some, there is some um, soft soil and kind of standing water over here. Um, but it was not like that in the summer. <laughs> so it's kind of disturbed over here for whatever reason. So it was a little different than it looked like in the summer. But anyways, that's our updated plan. Um, I can go into more detail on the wetlands, but probably not necessary. I guess um, I just, I understand you may need to continue tonight, but I was just wondering um, if you could say again what I would need to do to the to the plan to get it more um, up, to, up to snuff. Yeah, one of them is the polygon deline delineating the limits of the study area. Um, let's see. So they're on our they're on our slide here. Um, BBW north of Faring Brook was not delineated, and we'll need to have this on the findings of fact. Um, yeah, so that doesn't require a plan update. Okay. Um, that's just for the commission's. Uh, you know, when the commission issues, they'll just note that in in the ORAD. But the the um, polygon delineating the study area, I think, is really important just to make sure that we're clear what areas were delineated and which ones weren't. Yeah, is that it, Erin? Just the polygon? Okay. Yes. Okay, commissioners, any questions? Nope. Okay, uh, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, it took me a while to find my hand. I just... Uh... Uh, Rachel and I were on this site visit, and I just want to say it was a real pleasure to uh, spend some time with uh, Meredith and Darren and um, and Aaron. They 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 did a great job. Uh, some flags were uh, updated, um, and I the thing that was the most interesting to me was the project that they have in mind. Although it's not the subject in front of us. But Amherst College is going to be putting a bunch of thermal uh, geothermal wells under the parking lot, which is why they're doing this. They can use this for any other project. But um, uh, Amherst is moving in the direction of trying to decarbonize. And um, the work will be done in the parking lot and repaved. And we won't even see it when it's done. It's not germane for what's in front of us, but I thought it was very interesting uh, what they're going to do, and uh, it was a pleasure to spend time with them. Thanks, Alex. Um, if anyone, if no one else has a comment, just looking for a continuation. I move to continue the public hearing for zero and one five one Amherst College, uh, uh, one five one uh, College Street. Uh, for Amherst College, DEP number 0890734 to uh, 424 of this year at 7.40 p.m. Thanks, Andre. Um, okay, we already discussed what we'll need for an update, but presumably we'll have those before um, the Wednesday prior to that meeting. Okay, we have Andre on a motion. Second. Alex on the second. Alex. Aye. Chris. Aye. Andre. Aye. Rachel. I may have to abstain because Berkshire Design provided the survey, which was the basis for the project. Okay. I'm an I. All right. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Darren. Thanks, Thank everyone. Good night. So just to confirm, so the plans required by next. Wednesday, is that right? The, the 17th? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your time, everyone. Thanks. Okay. I'm opening this one. Yes, Erin. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Maybe I, as I do that, you can bring in anybody if you're here for this next cheering, which is Right Builders on behalf of Lisa Fang. Please raise your hand so we can bring you in. Okay, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Bylaws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this is a request for determination of applicability for right builders incorporated on behalf of Louisa Feng for the abandonment of an existing septic system and installation of a private sewer ejector pump and gravity sewer line within the buffer zone for 605 Station Road, Matt 24B, Lot 33, to an existing sanitary manhole located within Station Road. So is it okay if I jump in? Yes, I can't okay. see our participants, but I assume you managed that while I was talking. Okay, yes, yep. Okay. Um, so um, Nick is here from uh, Right Builders. I'll just give a quick um, couple comments on this and I can share photos um, and a plan while, while Nick presents. But um, my comments are basically that this is about as simple of a project as the Conservation Commission is gonna see, um, abandoning a septic system and then installing um, a sewer line coming from the house uh, to connect to the road. I don't have any concerns about the erosion control location. Um, my recommendation tonight would be for the commission to close the hearing and issue the determination of applicability. I have some draft conditions in the project folder. Um, and um, myself and Rachel were out on the site visit, so I'll share a couple site visit uh, photos, and um, that's all I have for comments. Thanks, Aaron. Nick, you want to take five? Sure. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, I got Todd Bindler from Right Builders as well, um, but I can just explain it, what we're trying to do. Um, we have added a bedroom to 605 Station Road for Louisa Fang's mom to live down there and her and her husband and two children to live upstairs, um, just kind of an aging in place so the family can be together. The existing septic system was very old and it didn't um, meet the requirements for that many bedrooms. So we had gotten a map from Jason from the DPW showing where the town had stubbed um, all those properties, the sewer tie-ins onto private property. Um, so yeah, this location right off the corner of the driveway, kind of where that first white flag is, that's kind of the area that we were, um, where the sewer tie-in is located. Um, so our plan was to kind of tie into where the septic system was coming out the back of the house, uh, kind of run our trench around kind of parallel to the stone walkway and uh, install a booster pump to get it up to the road and then um, tie into the town sewer. We um, have paid for that tie in fee, but obviously since uh, this project got flagged, we wanted to put together a site plan, uh, flag the whole site and kind of get Aaron and um, Aaron out there to kind of see what was going on. Um, so that that's pretty much the the situation. Um, we wouldn't even actually have to go into Station Road because the 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 stub is actually off the road in um in the grass or I guess the leaves there. But um, so yeah, that's kind of our project on hand. And um, thank you for hearing us out. Thanks, Nick. Any commissioner comments, questions? Okay, I don't see any public comment. So seeing nothing else, I'm looking for a motion. No, nope, I'm looking for a motion to close the hearing and issue a positive determination of applicability under Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws Article 3.31 and Regulations, checking box five, and a negative determination of applicability under the Wetlands Protection Act, checking box three with the conditions as drafted. Really no takers? Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was that a second, Alex? Yeah. Did you actually read the motion? I just did. Yeah. You did. That on was a power, gift. On the PowerPoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. A second. <laughs> okay, Bruce on the motion. Alex on the second. Rachel. I have to abstain on this one too. Um, Jeff Wright in our office. Jeff Slayer in our office prepared the 
engineering plans for this application. Okay. Um, Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thanks for joining, Nick. Have a good night. Thank you guys. You too. Thanks, Nick. See ya. Bye. Okay. Next up, notice of intent for Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Emily Dickinson Museum for the construction of a historic carriage house and associated site work in the buffer zone to boarding vegetated wetlands at 214 Main Street, map 14B, lot 26. Do we have anyone here tonight? Yes. All right, Aaron, do you wanna give us an update and I'll bring Chris Chamberlain in? Yes. Um, so, the the when the application was originally submitted um only one of the parcels had abutter notifications so um the applicant has since uh, notified abutters for the adjacent parcel where work is also taking place um the applicant also submitted some responses to um staff comments and a um a plan revision as well um the plan revisions were submitted on friday so um just to make sure that the commission was aware if you didn't see them in your packets, that's why. Um, and uh, I think we should just give the applicant an opportunity to explain the project. And then um, if you guys need more time to review the plans, then um, that's kind of where things things rest. Thanks, Eric. Sorry, Aaron. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> Do you wanna take five and give us the intro to the project? Sure. Um, and let me pull the plans up here. Um, so this is uh, actually that's not the best window. Let's start with where we are on the property. Probably more helpful. Um, so, of course, we're at the Emily Dickinson Museum, which uh, you're all familiar with the property um, located on Main Street. And we are focused on the um, evergreens portion of the property uh, with the main house located over here. And they're actually separate parcels. So this is the main parcel where the work is happening. Um, and then the additional land, which is uh, both pieces of land are owned by the trustees of Amherst College. Uh, the evergreens parcel where most of the work is happening is uh, part of the museum. And this property up here is part of Amherst College proper. We'll get into the, the details of what's going on in each one uh, in just a moment. Um, and I'll swap back to that plan here real quick. Um, um, and so um, the uh, site, uh, the purpose of the project uh, is essentially to um, reconstruct a historic carriage house that was associated with the Evergreens building, uh, which is, I highlighted on the previous map, is located on this portion of the property here with Main Street down below. Uh, you can see remnants of the old carriage house with some of these stones that were picked up on the survey. Um, those are not literally the footprint of the old carriage house, we don't believe. Um, but uh, they are uh, relatively close to the location, which is also corroborated by some uh, maps from the early 20th century. Uh, the carriage house was uh, originally associated with the Evergreens, which was the uh, home of Emily Dickinson's brother um, and was uh, associated with a driveway that sort of came up from um, Main Street uh, located in this area here. And the project is going to create what will ultimately function as a welcome center for the museum, uh, but will be constructed uh, with the appearance of the original carriage house that stood here and was torn down in about the 1950s. Um, going through this project, uh, we identified resource areas that are actually not on the museum property, but are on the college property, which you see delineated in this location here. Uh, as far as we can tell, this was dug at some point in the past as a drainage ditch, presumably to protect this land here from runoff coming down the hill. Um, if you go out there, you actually see uh, the depression of this ditch here and then mounded earth, which presumably was scooped out of the ditch to create a little bit of a berm in this area. Um, so originally created as artificial drainage, but now taking on the characteristics of a wetland is jurisdictional. Um, and so that's been delineated and added on to our survey. Um, the wetland corridor 
uh, has become sort of more significantly wooded with brush and frankly, quite a few invasive species um, located in here. Um, uh, but nearly the entire buffer area, which is uh, identified by the 100 foot uh, buffer line here, uh, virtually all of this buffer um, has been uh, either cleared or historically maintained as lawn. Uh, the lawn areas, as I'm sure you're familiar with, are in the southern portion of the property. And this area here has several significant trees in it, but is pretty much clear of any kind of undergrowth um, in this area. And the property's been that way for quite some time. And so looking at the proposed plan, um, the proposal is to construct this new building um, essentially on top of the historic location of the old carriage house. Um, it's slightly larger uh, than the original building. The original building we think was about 30 feet by 24. Uh, this building is 34 by 24. Um, and uh, of course designed to meet modern building codes and accessibility, um, but otherwise to replicate the appearance of the original um, carriage house that was on the site. Um, aside from that, uh, the major site feature is an extension of the driveway. If we look at the um, existing property, uh, current, the original driveway, which extended up to the carriage house, uh, has been truncated uh, and now terminates sort of in the middle of the site. And the way this works is the driveway sort of comes up, continues to come up the steep portion of the site, and then it flattens out in this area, um, but just sort of ends with lawn. Um, there's also an existing gravel path that connects the uh, the two uh, building main buildings on this site, uh, Emily's home, as well as the evergreens in this location here. And so that driveway is proposed to extend right up to the front of the carriage house, uh, as the records suggest that it did originally. And really the, the primary difference between the historic condition and today is that it's a little bit wider because we need to create an accessible um, parking space in this location. This building is too distant from the existing ADA spaces located near the Emily Dickinson house. Um, so we need to create a drop off parking area uh, closer to this building, which we've carved out in this location here, um, and then a small extension to allow our modern vehicles to get turned around and leave the driveway. Um, that uh, width is narrowed as we come closer to the building and is also integrated with that existing stone dust path, which is being realigned slightly um, to create a more uh, aesthetic uh, route to that path. Um, utility connections for the building. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to zoom here. Um, we have a water and electric are going to be fed from the adjacent Evergreens building along these routes here. Uh, stormwater uh, from the roof is going to be collected by gutters and downspouts and directed to a dry well uh, that will allow for some level of infiltration before exiting via a pipe and ultimately connecting to the municipal stormwater system. Um, so the, uh, the point sources from those downspouts are not discharged inside the jurisdictional area. Um, and then sort of the trickiest utility connection, which is a, a significant piece of work, is the sanitary sewer. Um, this welcome center will have restrooms in it. Um, the main street does not have a sewer running across the front of this property. There is existing sanitary service uh, to the Evergreens building, which is defunct. Um, its condition is unknown. Uh, we do know that it is uh, on the west or opposite side of the house, um, and it also traverses under a town-owned parcel um, between here and the, the next street uh, to the west. Um, and so it, essentially we're a little bit landlocked on sanitary. And so the proposal is to take sanitary out of the building and drop it into a pump station immediately in the back and then eject it through a force main onto that Amherst College property and ultimately connect to the sanitary sewer that's serving Marsh Hall, which is the dorm um, sort of at the top of the hill on that Amherst College property. Um, and as you'll notice, we have deliberately taken a route around this property line of the museum with the sanitary, and that was one of the staff comments that came up. The reason for that is the entire museum property is under an, uh, a, a historic restriction uh, that's running to the benefit of the Mass Historical Commission. 
any land disturbance that's proposed within the museum property has to be sent to Mass Historic. They review it, and if they uh, determine that previous land disturbances or previous archaeology have not been done in an area of new disturbance, uh, they will turn around and require the museum to do an archaeological study in the area of any new disturbance, which would include excavation of test pits uh, along the route of any new excavation, uh, which uh, would create significant additional disturbance, delay, and expense. Um, and so the proposal is to run the sanitary line just outside of the property so that the, the museum does not have to go through that effort because any other route would essentially take it through this northern portion of the property, which has never been disturbed as far as we know, um, and would be very likely to require an extensive archaeological study along the entire route of that sanitary before exiting the property. Um, and so, you know, as came up in the comments, of course, uh, and, and as we've shown on the plans, we are uh, within the no build and no disturb uh, portions under the local bylaw. Um, as sort of alluded to earlier on, the purpose for that is that the, the entire point of this project is to authentically replicate um, the original carriage house, which was located um, in this location here, which is close to uh, this wetland that was constructed. Um, and so we're hoping that the, uh, the commission will appreciate the value um, of maintaining this property in its historic character so that uh, um, visitors can come and uh, see the world as as Emily saw it as close as we can uh, while still abiding by um, modern building regulations and those sorts of things. Um, we have um, proposed as an, uh, some of, somewhat of a mitigation um, against some of that intrusion closer into the property. Um, invasive species removal in the shaded areas here between the work and the wetland in those wooded areas. Um, if you've been, if you had a chance to visit the site, uh, I also have some photos, there's quite a lot of invasive species. So we've uh, included a protocol on the plans uh, to remove those. Uh, we're proposing to plant eight native shrubs in this area, and there is a need um, to remove an existing mature tree in this location, which is in with, within the buffer and about two feet off of the proposed building. So we are also um, proposing to replace that with a new native species. Um, and one thing I want to note on that is um, when I was uh, replying to some of the staff comments and the comments that we had on our site visit in the field, this was an issue that came up. And so the revised plan uh, includes relocating the tree um, out of this tight buffer space and out into the site, which was a suggestion of Bruce and Aaron when we were on the site visit. Um, the plan that I submitted on Friday uh, notes a uh, six foot native oak or poplar. Um, however, uh, Jane was uh, Jane, the uh, museum director, was out of town, so I had put that on matching some of the species that are there. Um, since then, I've received a list uh, from the museum's records of species that had grown uh, on this site in the 19th century, uh, ran that by our landscape architects, and we've uh, whittled that down to, we'd like to propose either a dogwood, black walnut, or tulip tree as a native species that was appropriate to the time uh, in the 19th century. Um, as this planting. So that's a slight deviation from the plan that we've got on record. So we would uh, request that as a condition. Um, and I think we're open to uh, uh, what's the commission's preference on that. Um, Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm just going to jump in on that. Is, yeah, is, is that new recommendation that you just mentioned in the updated revision, the restoration plan that we received uh, was it Friday or, or something, or is that a new a new addition? So the location and the notes around the tree were species. included on Friday. Um, the species were not. I just got that list this afternoon from Jane after she'd been away. Okay. Um, my request is that we get a fully updated plan then so that we can review it. We were already going to have to continue this because we didn't have enough time to review the restoration plan. But I think just uh, coordinating with whoever you have to on all of the species and the location so that we just have something in front of us that we could review would be very useful. Um, 
So if you could get that to Aaron as soon as possible, that'd be great. Sure. Um, but thank you for that detailed introduction. Commissioners, do you have any questions, comments? I do. Andre, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if you can in include the species of the uh, shrubs as well, please. Sure, that's actually on the plan already. Those are low bush blueberry. Oh, okay, I didn't see that, sorry. And there's five of them? Uh, six eight of them? total. Okay, um, I see. Yeah. Got it, all right. I'll, I mean, we could check the plan out as long as all the species and locations and amounts are there. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I would, am I on mute? Nope. No. Okay. I would ask that the title be changed because what you're, you're, you're not, you're not building a carriage house. You're building a visitor center in the style of the historic carriage house. And so the, the purpose is a visitor center. And I, I understand that having been to the Emily Dickinson museum and uh, her brother's house many times. Um, that's really my only comment. Okay, um, that would be a sort of a new notice of intent, I think. Um, maybe we can change the... Yeah, I, and intent. I would just say that that for the purposes of the entire construction project, you know, this is known sort of in, in the museum as the carriage house project. Um, so we can certainly add notes to the plan, um, but I would really hesitate to change a title on this particular plan, which would then differ from all of the construction plans that we'd have going forward. I'm, I'm not gonna follow my sword on it. It's just, <laughs> um, Points it's taken. Um, I'm happy to refer to it as the project rather than the carriage house or the carriage house project. Um, yeah, okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, um, so you heard what we need from you, Chris, and we look forward to reviewing the update plans. And for tonight, we're looking for a motion to continue. Did you take public comment, Michelle? I didn't. I didn't see any hands up. Okay. That's my hand. But if there is any public comment, please raise your hand now. Okay. I move to continue the public hearing for 214 Main Street, Emily Dickinson Museum to 424 at 7.45 p.m. Second. Bruce on the motion, Alex on the second. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. Rachel? I have to abstain. I work with Berkshire Design Group. And I'm an I. Okay. Good night, Chris. Thank you. Okay, back to our other business. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, Emily has, I mean, Rachel has abstained on a number of projects uh, in her first meeting, and I'm wondering, and I understand she operates a business, but I'm wondering, is this, is she going to be able to vote uh, or going to need to abstain from a lot of projects. It could be come down to uh, a, a problem. So um, anything that, that is associated with Berkshire Design Group she'll have to abstain from. Um, but I just, so I, I'm, I apologize to the commission and to the public for this, but I have a sick baby upstairs who's crying really loudly and I'm going to have to try to move through this meeting if we can. Um, I just am hoping that we can resolve the outstanding items so that I can uh, um, get off the call soon. <laughs> um, just personal issue, but. Okay, we'll do what we can. Um, yeah, so let's just get to our enforcement. Um, 11 trillion. I see Amir here. Um, Aaron, okay, where did we leave off with this? So we were going to grant the deadline, but we were discussing some outstanding um, things that needed to happen first. So I think that's where we're at. Um, I'm just thinking about like a clear instruction that we can give to the landowner on that, like dates for the completion of the outstanding item. And then, you know, 
last deadline for the um the cleanup so and, i think what, go I think, ahead i think what we had talked about was um that i would do a site inspection bef to verify that the um slope stabilization had been completed all of the fill had been removed that the um erosion controls had been resolved and repaired in the back and the additional material um, that was beyond the controls had been cleaned up. And once I can visually verify that at that point, then um, the additional work could move forward and the commission could determine next steps as far as what else they may require. Um, there was also um, some staking for the 100 foot buffer zone that we had requested in the field just to clarify where the boundary was relative to the work that had taken place. Um, so I think, you know, if we can, if I can meet with Amir on site and get a, a quick look and verify that things have been completed or if there's anything else outstanding before those additional work items take place, I think that would be ideal. Thanks, Erin. I guess I'm unclear about what happens if you can't confirm that those have been done and we can't then give a, an extension. I mean, what's that step look like? Well, the extension that they requested is to, um, I believe, two days after our next meeting. So, um, you know, they've they've asked for a pretty wide window to try to get these issues resolved. I would say, like, before the end of the week or early next week, I could get out there to look at it, say, are there additional things that need to be taken care of, um, give him some marching orders, and then... Um, he could try to get those issues resolved. But I mean, it may take a couple steps along the way to get us there. Um, so I don't think we can in one night say we're going to have it sort of all resolved in terms of w what's going to happen and when it's done by. I think the, the key here is that the owner is making attempts to comply and address the commission's concern kind of in an incremental manner and that we can verify that. And if so, I do think it's worthwhile to work with them to try to give them some additional time that they need. Okay, I'd like to have a hard deadline on that as we discussed, which I think was, what was it, April 26th? Yes. And um, when you talk about staking the 100 foot when I was there, I thought that the project boundary was outside of the 100 foot. And you mentioned there is a discrepancy about maybe how they did it and how we consider the 100 foot to be measured. And that's definitely something we've discussed before as commissioners, how do we measure that 100 foot buffer? So are you guys like, how, are, how is, who's going to measure it? <laughs> who's going to Well, it's going to be it? done by survey and that's what okay, we perfect. let him know. Um, it can't be done with a measuring tape because it's, it's not going to be accurate. Okay. Sounds good. Alex, you have a question? Yeah, I support Erin being there to um, do her work. Um, the gentleman has um he speak his native tongue i think is not english and uh, i could be wrong there but i think it's native tongue is something other than english and there's i found it difficult to communicate with him as did aaron um but the memo that i that i read was am i wrong aaron um i think i i can i am able to communicate with him um yeah. Okay. The memo that I read was about giving an extension to get the sod down. And I would like to make sure the sod does not go down until um, until Aaron verifies that the, that the work has been completed, simply because you don't want to be driving across the sod with equipment. And um, so I didn't... I. Maybe I need to read the memo again, but I didn't think it was an extension to complete the work that Aaron asked for. So um, I just want to make sure the sod doesn't go down prior to the work being completed. Can we bring Amir on? Because he's uh, sitting in the audience and we could just verify with him that he'll sure. wait to lay the sod until sure. he can do a site visit. And maybe that'll give the commission some sure. uh, comfort. Hello, can you guys hear us? Yes. Hey. Yep. Let me just turn on the video. Okay, hi. My name is Iman. I've met with Aaron. Um, some of you other guys might not be familiar with me. I'm Amir's son. Um, the extension that we requested was pretty straightforward. It was just that um, the topsoil that was being put down, the site where guys were worried that if we put it down, given the rain we had last week, um, 
uh, with the current schedule that we had that it might cause for more kind of erosion, which was kind of, I think, what we were trying to combat. Um, I know Erin was unable to come out because um, her child is sick. So I did send some photos. I don't know if you had a chance to go over them um, in a video, if that helps at all. Um, but um, I think if you come out, you'll see that a lot of the work has been, I think for the most part, we've we've nailed just about every um, every one of the bullet lines on the um, on the enforcement order. Um, so I think um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but again, just for the sod and for the to prevent more erosion, that was what we were asking for the extension of. Thanks. Alex, is that good? You're clear? Okay. Um, so can I, I just ask a question, some pointed questions, because I am going to need to hop off of this call. Um, uh, Amir um, and uh, Iman, sorry if I'm messing up your names. No, um, okay. Um, is Would you be comfortable with me coming out to do a site visit to verify the work has been done? Um, either end of this week, early next week, and, and holding off on laying the sod until I can do that kind of confirmation process. And yeah. then as soon as I do that, then we can just coordinate um, before the meeting on the 24th on the remaining item. As, as I told you that I have a urgent uh, travel, I have to, I have a 92 year old mom, I have to go and visit because she's not in good health. And uh, so I'm leaving on Friday. So I'm doing, and Iman is here. We did majority of the work, Hoss did all the work, and just the rain that basically delayed, messed up everything. But I would appreciate if you can make a room that we could come tomorrow and see, you know, that would be perfect. Any time would be fine. fine. Does that yeah. work for you, Erin? Yeah, I, I should be able to figure okay. that out. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. So, so an extension, my recommendation is the commission issue an extension to the the meeting on the 24th and allow me to coordinate um, with the own landowner on the remaining items and provide an update to you on the 24th. Okay, does that work for everybody? Are we are we moving on that or can we just decide? I think there should be a motion okay. to extend the deadline on the enforcement order to April 24th to allow more coordination with the landowner. Okay. So moved. I thought it was the 26th. Yeah. Well, April 24th is our next meeting. They asked for a deadline to the 26th, but the 24th would give us another opportunity to review this. All right. All right. Was that a motion, Alex? I heard a motion from Alex looking for a second. Okay. okay Bruce on the second. Rachel? Hi. Vote? Okay. Um, Andre? That's an I. Bruce? Alex? Aye. And I'm an I. Thank you both for sitting through the call. Yeah, thanks for staying on, guys. Good night. Yeah, thank you, guys. Appreciate you. See you tomorrow, then. Nice to see you. So, okay. Aaron, you're going to call me? Or yeah, I'll call to, to set up a time. It'll probably be afternoon, um, okay. Amir. Anytime okay. would be fine. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Aaron, let me know when that is, and I'd be happy to go with you. Okay. Okay. Um, Do you have to go, Aaron, or do you want to wrap I, up? I do, but um, I mean, if I could just, we did meet with the owner of um, Wildflower Drive. We had a productive meeting. I did confirm that Ward Smith is going to be helping um, the owner file a notice of intent application. So I'll provide the commission with an update from there. I think the only other thing we need to resolve is um, the, I, and maybe this is just, I got mixed up, but did we resolve um, what's happening for um, UMass? Um, at the at the yeah front of the we meeting. did a thirty day extension oh thirty day extension okay I just sorry I'm I got scrambled because we had so much going on tonight okay so I think we covered everything then just, okay just for the record Bruce and I went on that site so uh, we're at that meeting yeah um if it wasn't so late I'd want to hear all about it um but I don't see anybody here to talk about it or. Okay. Yeah, Alex, did yeah. you want to comment on it? No, just for the okay. record. Thank you for attending, Bruce and Alex. Um, okay, well, and is there any public comment not uh, related to any of our hearings? Please raise your hand now.
I'm seeing none. Okay, with that, we'll let everybody go. So looking for a motion. I move that we adjourn. I second. Alex on the motion, Rachel on the second. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye, it's 941, Bruce. Got it. And I'm an aye. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. All.